Are we okay to begin? Yeah. They seem okay? Yeah. yeah. Okay then. So then, let's see here. Okay, I have control over my document, which is a good sign. And with that then, I will begin. Um, so yes, my talk today concerns a rather small corner of Nishitani literature. Um, but I hope the way that I tell the story will um, perhaps uh, gain some interest from all of those diverse perspectives that are gathered here today. Um, so with that, I, be, I begin. Uh, so Rudolf Boltzmann begins his essay, New Testament Mythology, by laying out the three-storied mythical worldview, earth in the center, heaven above, and the underworld beneath. From this mythological worldview, found to be unacceptable to modern man, Boltzmann seeks a way to extract what's proclaimed therein. As some have noted, Nishitani Keiji too has left us with something of a three-storied worldview. The standpoint of nihility in the center, that of consciousness above, and then finally, shunyata below. Of course, this is not a mythological worldview, and yet it challenges us in a way that certainly draws a parallel. Like Boltzmann's modern man, we today are perhaps in a situation where this talk of standpoints or fields has sedimented into an incredible myth of its own, a story that may somewhat distract from its own message. So, to paraphrase Boltzmann, what meaning can we attach to such phrases as descended into nihility, or even further, into shunyata? To bring into relief the challenge of Nishitani's topology, I propose excavating some of its philosophical background. But to orient our discussion, let's begin with a sketch of standpoint, or tachiba in general, and then complement this with Nishitani's usage in particular. So tachiba can be defined as follows. A, a place one stands, or where one is standing. B, the whence from which one does something, where one takes one's stand. C, the position, situation, or conditions in which one who stands is placed. D, a way of seeing or of thinking things, a point of view, where one is grounded. So drawing these together, we could say that standpoints are what position, situate, or condition our actions and perspectives. In this sense, a standpoint, literally and figuratively, enables doing and seeing through restriction. Now interestingly, definition C suggests a passive being placed. If a standpoint positions, situates, and conditions, it's because we are placed at a given position, in a given situation, or under given conditions, so to speak. Yet, consider definition B. I should justify my translation of tatsuse as where one takes one's stand. The se of tatsuse is the shallow of a river where one may cross, asase, but also where the stream runs fastest, hayase. As in the expression, mi ostete koso ukabuse mo are, to one prepared to give up oneself a shallow comes to the surface, the image is of an opportunity to be taken, Nishitani himself comments that a standpoint must be won or seized, tatakai torareta. This taking, toru, of one's standpoint is what Nishitani calls jikaku, or self-awareness. As we'll have a chance to see, Nishitani uses jikaku to indicate a concrete knowledge of the self, or better put, a knowledge of our koto as existence. In this sense, I'll suggest self-awareness is taking a stand by acknowledging one's position, situation, or condition. So in chapter four of Religion and Nothingness, Nishitani brings his drama between realism and idealism to a height. In this story, various philosophical standpoints of realism emerge from everyday life, orienting themselves by either sensibility or reason. These realisms, however, are challenged by idealisms that expose their hidden presuppositions. Let's turn our attention to the confrontation with respect to reason. It's here that in Nishitani's story, the old metaphysics, which contends we grasp independently existing substance, oh dear, through the faculty of reason, uh, this old metaphysics is challenged by Kant, who takes then that the concept of substance is to be a rule of pure understanding's cognitive action. Perhaps surprisingly, what Nishitani does not say is that Kant, in his critique, initiates some fundamental shift away from the old metaphysics, but instead puts the difference in the following terms. The change is just that the relationship between object and representation as the hidden basis in the old metaphysics was drawn into the light and acknowledged as the basis in Kant's critical philosophy. Nishitani is not then talking about two contrasting approaches to philosophy, one that assumes the givenness of substance and one that rejects that givenness. Instead, by reinterpreting the old metaphysics from the results of Kant's project, 
He characterizes the latter as a disclosure of the real situation, or as the standpoint of the subject and its self-awareness. This deepening of self-awareness, then, evinces an acknowledgement of one's basis, a kiban, a self-understanding of one's koto. Now, if the talk of standpoints is all about learning about ourselves, wouldn't it be more straightforward to talk of analyses and descriptions of the facts of human life? So here we need to stress the language of an acknowledged basis, for it's on this point that Kant truly was decisive for Nishtani. That is, in the self-awareness of the subject, one no longer merely learns new facts about oneself. The conclusions Kant drew from the ideality of substance and causality, I would like to suggest, I would lead us away from self-knowledge of facts and toward a language of standpoints and self-awareness. As Nishitani writes in Religion and Human Life, when we take ourselves to be natural beings and thereby understand ourselves to be already equipped with some essence, something important is overlooked, precisely what's called human life. For the human being can understand herself from within. When it's said the human is, this way of being is always that of understanding oneself while being. Furthermore, this self-understanding human being is something that must truly become human. The human being is essentially implicated in the task that it must truly become human. This task is knowing how oneself truly is, becoming thus and being thus. It is the problem of one's being and self-awareness, knowing the self. And if we delve further into the task-like character of human life, the problem of one's being and self-awareness, it becomes clear that this task is fulfilled only by having one's own measure or standard, something which, nevertheless, has a kind of universality, objectivity, or necessity. The importance Nishitani puts on what we could call this shift from substance to subject is not one that suddenly emerged in the 50s. This issue comes into sharp relief in an essay uh, published in Niso in 1934 and included in Nishitani's first book. In Temporanity and Permanence in Morals, Nishitani offers a relevant discussion of action in its total concreteness. He begins with so-called technical action, which he identifies with Poiesis and Aristotle, actions like building houses. This qualifies as action to the extent that it can be distinguished from mere material process by the structural relationship it maintains with thinking, or noesis. Yet Nishitani hesitates to call this concrete action, for he contends that the action, insofar it is determined by the eidos, or form of the house, say, is ruled by the necessity of natural law. In this case, Nishitani puts suggestively, the subject of action is still substance. Pertinent for our discussion today is that Nishitani does not seem to believe there really is mere technical action. The distinction is one of perspectives, genshi. In other words, the problem is not what kinds of concrete human activities count as actions, but what perspective enables us to truly comprehend concrete human activities at all. And the problem is quickly compounded, for the perspective we have on our own actions is not a mere theoretical matter. On the one hand, our understanding of our activity is a self-understanding. When we understand our own activity in its concreteness, as performed with free spontaneity, we, Nishitani writes, come to gather ourselves, become for ourselves, which is all to say, in this being self-aware, the subject must come to make herself manifest. But on the other hand, the self-understanding is not just finding out about ourselves some always already present fact. For example, that even in technical action, we're not determined by our object. This does not mean, in other words, that the self enters into an intelligible world already opened up somewhere, but its own determination of the will first opens this world up right below. By achieving a certain perspective, we open up a world, which must be understood not as something that is for us, but as something we ought to make be. It must be understood not contemplatively, but strictly only as a practical standpoint. The intelligible world, Nishitani continues, is nothing more than a certain manner of existence. The key idea can be put as follows. We become self-aware as subjects by recognizing that we have a standpoint. We, in other words, open up this world right below by coming to acknowledge that what we are is no more than what we recognize we ought to be. To have a standpoint, then, is to be responsive to the ought, to demands. In this sense, a standpoint is the condition in which one is placed, not in the sense of natural laws, but as demands whose necessity relies on our recognition of them as such. By acting in accordance with these demands, the task of our being in self-awareness is realized. Furthermore, if self-awareness is about our koto as existence, and not just one's koto, then what is realized is one's own being, what attained one's own self-awareness. For the demands to which one is responding are one's own measure or standard. It's in this measure or standard that one is grounded, and from these that one acts. Now, one useful way, perhaps, to explore Nishitani's topology 
could be in terms of identity. Indeed, in a late lecture from 1971, Nishitani himself uses this kind of language, throwing oneself out in one's entirety as returning to oneself is the clear identification of oneself, identification. Within the self-awareness of one truly becoming oneself, he continues, affirming oneself or negating oneself is not a matter of either self-righteousness or self-torment, but of properly having grounds. What could he mean by this suggestion? In this lecture, Nishitani returns to the example given earlier of building a house. If we take the carpenter, for example, within making the house, he knows himself. Making becomes knowing, becomes self-awareness. If he truly knows himself, then he could say, look at this house. This is me. Noteworthy is that the carpenter is summoning someone to acknowledge him. To be capable of summoning someone requires properly having grounds. I think this brings us back around to another important sense of tachiba as tatsuse. In common usage, tatsuse is used as tatsuse ga nai, expressing the lack of having a place to take one's stand. Here one could also say menboku ga nai. One lacks a place, that is, because one lacks a face worth meeting others. One is discredited, as we would say in English. But menboku nai is also the beginning of an apology, the recognition of failure. The story coming into focus is something like the following. The standpoint of consciousness, qua standpoint, is something we sustain by taking a stand, and thus something that could fail. Coping with this failure, finding one's grounds, and once more taking a stand, begins with the recognition of this failure as a failure. It begins with identifying with the failure. Now the next step, of course, is forgiveness. And perhaps if there is any proper place for something like the work of waiting, uh, it is there. Thank you very much. Silva, sorry, Silva. Or oh, from Silka to Silva. Uh, Silva, uh, beautiful job. One question. I agreed with what you said about the arts of recognition that follows from Nishitani's theory of self awareness. Maybe you could explain briefly how this connects with his thesis on nihilism. Hmm. Uh, yes, thank you for the, the question. I, I can't actually see who this question was. Oh, okay, I see now, from, from Peter. Um, yes, so I've tried to suggest at the end, um, trying to give us a different perspective on this whole myth of uh, consciousness, nihility, and shunyata, and try to frame this in what would it make, uh, how could we make sense of the idea that consciousness or our, our ability to make the world intelligible, uh, what would happen if this, if this failed? And what would it mean to come to recognize that as a failure? And so what I see here is, is this tension then now in the way that, the, that Nish, Nishitani develops his, his idea is, so Nishitani himself is trying to say that there's a sense in which we can come to become kyomu, right? Kyom ni narikiru. And I'm wondering if, if the way that we become something is through this process of identification, um, perhaps one way we can understand that is by identifying with one's own failures. And so the question is then, do we have the resources now to, in Nishitani to develop this theory of learning how to identify with our own failures. Thank you, this was very helpful, but I still would like to ask uh, you to explain a bit more in detail how this failure is, is to be understood. Because I read Nishitani's thesis on nihilism that his account on, on failure is all encompassing, a, a kind of a, 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 a total failure. And I rather wonder how with means of arts and recognition you find mm. a way out of this radical failure. This is what I wanted to ask. I see. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, do I have time to, to make one more response or should we? 
Oh, sorry. There is another. There is. Oh, sorry. There are other. Okay. Oh, there yes. are other. There are other questions. Okay. I'll, yeah. I can we, see we, the, can, we can take oh. more. Okay. Can I follow? Uh, no. It, it, that's. Oh, yeah. Anton Sevilla has a question. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Anton Sevilla. Okay. Actually, it's uh, pretty much a follow-up from what the professor Liederbach was saying. Uh, I, I wonder. What, my concern actually is the word identification. Yeah. Because um, if you're still identifying with a failure, let's say I'm a loser or I can't get it right. In a sense, isn't that still the standpoint of consciousness? Yes. Yes. In a sense, uh, you know, the, the whole ability to be able to define what you are, you mm. still haven't quite, quite got into the A is not A yet. Mm, mm. So in a sense, I wonder if, you know, I, if you use the word identification very flexibly, I could see how it could apply to all three standpoints. But I think there would be a markedly different kind of approach to the word identify when it comes to inhibitor or shunyata, what do you think about that? Um, yes, so I'm thinking that we would have to hash out a little more clearly um, what, what, what we understand by this uh, standpoint of consciousness. I think as, as Peter mentioned, if we understand the breakdown of the standpoint of consciousness as this sort of all-encompassing uh, um, um, failure of intelligibility, um, then the question is, okay, so now that intelligibility has collapsed, um, how, how do we have any resources um, to identify something like a failure? And I think the way that I am understanding this is trying to take it outside now of the individual perspective. So coming to recognize a, a collapse of intelligibility in, as, as it happens in society and kind of taking that as a, a collective failure, right? And trying to understand what, how do we now, um, how do we now heal this, heal this collective failure and overcome it? So while a failure of intelligibility is certainly an existential possibility, right? So, uh, I mean, if we take it in this sense, um, then the issue is not okay. So now that as an individual I have this failure and there's nothing I can do about it, but rather how as a society do we do we make amends with that possibility in our in our collective way of being? Thank you. That's an interesting approach. Thanks.